What up YouTube, it's October 10th. It's about 5.52 a.m. I was trying to figure out a million ways that I was gonna start this. And it's, like I said, the other two videos that I said I wasn't gonna unveil, I went ahead and did it for safe purposes. But it's basically the same topic. It's me trying to understand, well, I understand it, but you know, getting more of a solid foundation or a solid basis as to that which Islam or Islamists rest their premise on, you know, as far as like, uh, how do you think about Jesus, what they believe about Jesus? I already know or knew where they were coming from, so I did like a little two-part practice vlog yesterday. It was supposed to be quick. So today, this is just kind of like official, but a lot of the information or a great majority of the information that I put on those two previous blogs from yesterday I mean, it's basically valid, so this is really definitely going to be less than 20 minutes because some of it is going to be reiteration. So anyway, yesterday when I did this, I had quoted a Sora, and like I said, it's four, and it was verse 157, but I went back and I started from verse 130, and I read all the way up to 170. Still within book four. Again, I'm not 100% sure on the language as far as like within the Surah. But I guess like book four, if not chapter four of this Surah. And then again, from 130 all the way up to 170. So a lot of what I'm going to speak on in the first half of this is basically reiteration of some of what was spoken about within that Surah. But which is mentioned again in a different Surah. So the first ones I'm going to start out with is the one because... Uh, when I did this yesterday, you know, I took, I, lately, I wouldn't say lately, I'd say probably like within the last, probably like seven vlogs that I did, you know, I ain't write down no notes, I, I tried to make sure I retain everything off top, like when I do these vlogs, it's still off the top, but I'm talking about as far as like the process. You know, lately I ain't been writing shit down, but I just felt like, you know, just to be safe to make sure I don't forget certain shit. As I was researching, I was writing key shit down, you know what I'm saying? But again, still, when I do this, it's off the fucking top. But uh, those little surahs that I wrote down that I mentioned in the first two practice blogs of this, I went ahead and read them. Now, it was two at the end. One was, um, I guess, again, book 66 and then verse 11, and then another one was uh, 21 something. I forget exactly what it was, but those two is not really that relevant because the information that that, 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 that those uh, verses contained was basically repeats or like little insignificant type of shit, you know what I'm saying? So I just, I, I, I ruled out those two. But um, two of those surahs that I did reread was, the first one was, Again, either book or chapter three, and it was supposed to be from verse 33 up until verse 36. But again, I no, 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 wait, 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 yeah, 33 to 36. But I started back as far as damn, what was it? I think 20. I know I went all the way up to 70. Probably 28. Nah, nah, 33. I think I did I did start from 33. 33 all the way up until 70. Again, remember, that's book three. So basically, they were just talking about, like, the genealogy of everybody up until Jesus. So they went back and they started with the guy, Imran, right? And again, they spoke on him, just like I mentioned in the first two blogs. You know, uh, he had a wife. And he was blessed with Mary. Uh, his wife communicated with God. God let it be known that Mary was going to be somebody special and that all of her kids is going to be blessed. Before I go on, I'm going to go ahead and point out this part too, but this is also an exotic detail. The first two blogs, I kept using the term exotic to make like little notes or certain shit that stood out to me. So this right here is an exotic detail also. Uh, between 33 and 36, and I'm going to say 37 to be safe, when they talked about Mary, 
end where Imran and then him and his wife uh, basically giving birth to, or his wife giving birth to Mary, when God was speaking to her or his wife and saying that she was going to be blessed, it was mentioned that all of her descendants, Mary, I'm talking about Mary, all of Mary's descendants from Satan, that's the word they use, will be blessed as well. And I was like, what the fuck? Now, first off, like before I did those two blogs yesterday, I had came across that and I read it. And I'm like, okay, that sounded a little off script and then somewhat too good to be true. You know, even though I was, you know, I, I hope for the realistic aspect of certain tokens of this religion as far as the history and some, some of the things they believe. So even though it could be somewhat disappointed, but it was still kind of interesting to me at the same time. So I had rechecked and I looked at another source and it was the same thing. And they didn't really speak too much on that. You know, they didn't really um, elaborate on that particular part as far as her descendants from Satan. And then they also used the word the great expeller or something like that. Basically, uh, just... For my understanding, I wanted to make sure the term Satan within a context didn't mean anything other than what hit me when I first came across the word. But it actually does mean Satan, the devil, or whatnot, the bad guy. So I was like, what? But anyway, they went on, and then, let me see, okay, so Mary, as far as her, uh, they mentioned how when she was young or whatnot, it was another guy named Zachariah who was chosen to take care of us. So she was placed in his care. Now at this point, or at that point, I was like, okay, I'm not I'm not sure if he was kind of like, because I'm thinking about the cultural aspect of what went on back in the day, because you still had concubines and people like that. But still, those are mostly females. But, you know, you could be a male and also be a slave at the same time. So I'm thinking like, okay, outside of what they mentioned here, as far as the actual culture, back then I'm like this guy Zachariah who I don't know too much about I know he's mentioned in the Bible also I'm like was he some type of uh, male servant but was still chosen to look after Mary you know that, that that was a question that you know just like the whole mention about the Satan I'm like shit I had questions about that but even though they didn't elaborate that's like it, it, it became a lingering question in my mind so as far as Zachariah you know, as far as like understanding what was going on exactly then and the value of each character that they mentioned, I want to know for sure, like, was he just kind of like a, a somebody of a lower caste? So he was a servant of a sort, but he was also mentioned to look after her. The reason why I don't really want to skip that part or didn't want to skip it is because I'm thinking about like when I read it, I thought about Muhammad. You know, he had a lot of people that was looking after him, too, aside from his uncle, Abu Talib, when his mom died. For example, the Ethiopian lady, the Coptic lady, for example. Uh, what was her name? Um, um Habib. Yeah, Um Habib. Like, she is somebody that is also credited with raising Muhammad, as well as, you know, pinning or writing down some of his, his teachings. So she was also a scribe as well. Okay, so that's a better understanding as far as the sociology of that day with Muhammad. So going back even far beyond that, when they mentioned Zachariah, that's what I was trying to understand about him. Like what exactly was his value from a sociological standpoint in that period or during that period. But he was chosen to look after her. So because Mary was blessed by God, you know, she was uh, religious growing up, and she used to go into temples and pray a lot. Because Zachariah looked after her, you know, he came in the temple one time. This is according to the surah. Remember, it's three, 33 all the way up to 70. He came in the, the temple one time, and, and she was praying, and he was struck by this, you know, they use the word provision that, you know, God had over her. So I paused right there thinking about that. I'm like, okay, basically they're trying to say like, you know, he was able to feel some type of <clears throat> anointment from her. That's how I look. That's how I took it when I read it. I'm like, okay, they're talking about some type of uh, vibe or something. 
especially my understanding of what the term prevision means. So it's like, if she's surrounded with like provision or something like that, she got some type of vibe or feeling that emanates from her that is so strong, he's able to feel it when he's in her presence. So it stood out to him. So he inquired, he asked her about that. And of course she gave all praises to God. So within that moment, he prayed to God and he asked for an offspring. Now, Zachariah, you know, based on what they wrote about him, I'm thinking like he's an older guy. I'm going to explain why in a second. So he prayed to God for an offspring. And an angel answered him. And make a long story short, you know, he was like, okay, yeah. But you got to, for three days, you okay, this would be a, well, well, basically, as far as like the dialogue between Zachariah and God, you know, it was basically uh, communicated to him that this wish would be granted and it would and, and it, it, it come true or whatnot. And so he was like asking questions like, how are you going to be able to grant me a seed when my wife is barren? Now, I'm going to assume they're trying to say like she like she can't have kids or something. I'm not thinking that, you know, I know what barren, barren means. But I'm not thinking they're trying to say she dead or retarded or some shit. You know what I'm saying? So I'm going to assume that means that she she's she cannot bear a child for whatever reason. And it's probably due to old age. But again, God let him know. Or it was uh, confirmed to him that God is powerful and God could do all things, etc. And they was like, okay, well, we'll give you a sign. For three days, you wouldn't be able to. Let me see. Let me get it right. For three days, he wouldn't be able to communicate. He would only be able to make gestures to people. And he'll have to pray or give praises to God for three consecutive days. And they said from uh, the evening to the morning. That's what they said. All right. So, like, you know, a little bit before that, as far as the part about the... Um, walking around for three days and not being able to speak, but just to make gestures. I'm thinking that was a um, a commandment from God, but Zachariah, yeah, would have to reciprocate that by um, giving praises to God for three consecutive days straight throughout the whole entire day, basically almost the entire day from evening to morning. So then they mentioned that and they didn't again on that part right here this this is when he transitioned back into mary and then continue the story as far as her but as far as zachariah i was kind of curious i wanted to know did he eventually get to or his wife or somebody somehow some way shape or form eventually end up with another seed they didn't go beyond that as far as this portion that i read again 33 all the way to 70 it wasn't really mentioned within that portion but they went on and they started talking about mary and they will uh, like my cigarette back up so they went back and they started talking about mary basically and uh God wanted her to have a child. But just like I mentioned in the first two blogs, she didn't have a significant other. So, uh, with the dialogue between her and God, basically, God, let, I'm trying not to say he, but you know, they believe that God is a person anyway. So, he informed her that he's able to to facilitate this basically and he promised her that he would that's essentially the dialogue so eventually she left from her family and then she went somewhere to the east she went east when she went east that is when like i mentioned with the first two blogs that is when god had fashioned or created some male or human being not somebody that was already existing in existence but he created another guy specifically for her. Not gonna go into everything else I did think as far as that, because I already mentioned that in the first two practice blogs. So this guy had met 
Mary, wherever that she had went to, he met up with her and they had a conversation. She let him know where she was coming from and then he told her what his purpose was and how he was supposed to bless her. So he blessed her. They ended up having the sex because they said she conceived. And then uh, during her pregnancy, I guess, toward the end of it. Because like I say, the way that, that they explain it, you know, they don't include everything. They're kind of like giving an overview almost. It's kind of, you know, as far as how I took it in. So she ended up giving birth and she was exhausted. So she was walking and then it was a tree that she ended up not collapsing, but just basically um, sitting down at or whatnot. And so that's when she had to look conversation with God again. And he, he basically let her know what well, he didn't let her know, but he made it to where some dates fell off a palm tree, a, a tree or whatnot. And then it fell. She ate that. He told her just to sit back, relax and eat this. And if any humans uh, cross paths or come about, let them know basically that you're um, abstinent, in other words. So then after that ordeal, she ended up traveling back to her family. And when she went back to her family, you know, there was like a little dispute. You know, they was wondering where she went to. So they were sort of kind of like scolding her. And then, you know, they brought up a comparison between her and her father, uh, Imran, and her mother. They didn't name her mother specifically, but they was basically trying to say that these people were of great integrity and holy. And his mom, and her mom was never somebody that went out fucking, you know what I'm saying? Uh, being uh, unchaste or whatnot. And so she pointed toward the baby that she had delivered already before she made it back to her family. And, you know, trying to basically say, this is the reason, this is why I was out. You know, this is a, a, a gift from God or whatnot. And... Um, people looked at the baby I can't remember if she if she said something like speak to the baby or something like that. I know she was trying to point toward Jesus as being her reason for this leave of absence this long leave of absence especially if it takes nine months you know for you to deliver for a baby to fully develop in your belly so she was gone for almost a year basically and so she used the baby as a reason for that make a long story short the baby Jesus started talking to her family, the crowd that's around, and saying the same things that she was saying, but you know, basically repeating what God's purpose for him being born on this planet was. So that's that part. And then let me see. Um, and then as far as the Sora, as they continue on the, the dialogue completely, you know. It, they made it clear that they were speaking to Muhammad because they had his name in brackets like old Muhammad. So the question that I had when I did the first two blogs about this is like, when I was like, man, same like they kind of jumping around, who exactly are they talking to? You know, I, these are people that's communicate, communicating with Muhammad. Let me throw that note in there. So it's like, you know, Gabriel the angel, but I'm gonna say angels, only because of what I mentioned in the first two blogs, what I noticed when I read book four, 154. But just to be accurate, book four, 130 up until 170. When I read that, a lot of times, a, a few times within that surah that I read and those verses, uh, 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 40 verses, you know, they mentioned, they, 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 they kept saying we, you know, that's plural. So therefore, whoever was speaking to Muhammad was not just a single person, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, as far as the dialogue, as far as uh, what I read today, you know, they, they was like, um, uh, damn shit. Yeah, yeah, they went back to the dialogue and they speak to Muhammad. Now, one thing that I noticed, which was verse 350, that stood out to me, 350. Remember again, this is from 33 up until 70. So really verse 50, not 350. I keep on confusing the, the actual book, the, you know, the, the, the book three with, you know what I'm saying, the, the verse, I keep saying 350, but verse 50. But again, this is between verse 33 and 70. When they got to verse 50, it was said in there, as far as the Torah, right? And that is part off top. These angels are still speaking to Muhammad 
but a lot of what they had to say, like they'll go back, like they're 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 talking to Muhammad, but they're giving him knowledge at the same time. And not only just giving him knowledge, they'll give him guidance, which I'll point out further in a second. So this particular part of 350, off top, I'm not sure if they um, are basically paraphrasing words from Jesus to the people in his day, or if they are... Um, Kind of speaks to mama, but I'm gonna say that I'm, I'm gonna say they, they were paraphrasing Jesus from back in the day because they were like, well, you know, um, you know, I, I I came to confirm all of the wisdom and everything that was taught in the Torah. They didn't say it exactly like that. They didn't read exactly like that. It was just like I'm here to confirm the Torah, but I'm here to confirm all the knowledge and the wisdom in the Torah, and also to uh, outlaw some of the things that's already forbidden from you people in the first place. The reason why I thought that was kind of interesting is only because, and again, I'm not going to go too further on this part, it's only because going back to this whole thing with Muhammad and him believing a lot of these notions, the whole thing with Islam, really, believing these notions about Abraham and this and that, so I was thinking like, okay, that particular verse would be almost kind of like ammunition for people that consider themselves to be Hebrew because that's like, even though it's within the Quran, I'm pretty sure that's in the Bible too, but as far as like the Quran, if you're a person that's Hebrew, you might take that and say, okay, that's, a, that, that's proof right there of the, uh, I don't want to say holiness because that's not the fucking word that I'm searching, but basically like the holiness of the, the Israelites or the Hebrew people. Somebody at the door? Yeah. Only I'm gonna have to be there. So, uh, look, I'm in the room. No notes. I got no choice but to go in the room. Anyway, I'm thinking like they might look, I'm like, yeah, hopefully y'all can see my face. Anyway, I'm looking like, damn, they might take that and, like, if you're a person that's Hebrew, you could take that and, and try to make an argument for the holiness of a particular group of people. That's how I thought about it. And I'm like, okay, for this to be placed in the Quran, you know, it can be kind of looked at as a big deal. But as far as my knowledge and the shit that I read, I'm like, okay, then again, you got the distinction. You got the Adonites and you got the Quatanites. And a lot of what I read from the book, The Origins of an Islamic State, you know, he'll make a lot of reference to the Quatanites. So these are supposed to be people that's like the closest to being purified Arabs, right? This is what I'm thinking at the time as I read this this this, this verse, uh, verse 50. I'm like, shit. I'm like, um, okay, they're talking about people leaving uh, my rib. During the first century, after the after the Aram dam, dam collapsed, and then that's when people started making migrations going north, and as they went more further north throughout Arabia and uh, uh, Western Asia, you know, of course they're gonna mingle with the population there, and then mix with them as well. And so, as far as like the term Ananites, that applies for all these tribes. There are a mixture of early Arabians that left Yemen. And went north as far as uh, Jabaya and settled there, or not settled there, but basically, yeah, around 222 AD or whatnot. So, as I'm reading this part, I'm like, okay, I could see how that might not be a big deal to people that consider themselves Islamists because even though you got like this whole little thing as far as the Hebrews, you still got the the, 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 the Arab lineage as well. It goes back at least the first century. Granted, that's after the fact, but still. Because even if you consider that, consider that principle and you say, well, you know, everybody that came from Yemen, they're basically considered uh, Quatanites. Or people that lived there, especially during that time, are considered Quatanites. And then later on, as they migrate north and they mix... I'm trying not to use the term miscegenate, but basically they mix with other tribes throughout Arabia and uh, Asia Minor and elsewhere. 
then that's when those people are referred to as Adonites. But at the same time, what about even before the first century? If that's a principle that remains true, what about the populations during the late BC era that lived in Arabia and then still went north? In other words, this, this, because you know how like they call uh, Arabians or people like that that came into North Africa during the seventh century. It was a lot of people of uh, Beduin. Uh, Basically, a lot of people that were Arabs or Beduins, because Beduins basically means somebody that's uh, like those who are non sedentary but also somebody that's Arabian as well. Those are the two meanings of those terms. But I'm like, as far as like the principle, what about the people before the first century? So including in the B.C. era, if you're coming from Yemen, Arabia too, but mostly Yemen, and you're going north, then... You could apply the same concept. So in other words, from my point of view and my understanding, the blood or the term Quatanites and the term Adonites may be a little bit more significant than just the Hebrew term. So going back to verse 50, when he starts saying like, um, uh, I came to confirm that which was written in the Torah. I'm like, okay, maybe that may not make too much of a difference as far as like you, you know, being concerned that you know somebody of a certain perspective, such as like somebody that considered themselves to be a Hebrew, you know, it might not be a big deal when they look at that and try to extract something from it. You know what I'm saying? Only because of looking at the the the, the, the broader picture. And again, just to add a little bit more understanding to what, what the fuck I'm trying to say, I'm thinking about Joshua again. I'm thinking about um. Uh, King Solomon and those that came after him, but I know a little bit more about King Solomon and Joshua. You know, these are people that's always considered themselves to be Hebrews or the Persians of uh, God who set these laws in stone and they had the Ark of the Covenant and all that type of stuff. You know what I'm saying? That's why I like when I read that verse 50, I'm like, ooh. But then again, like I say, when I thought about it a little deeper, I'm like, right, I understand it. But anyway, that's the first one. Another one that stood out to me as far as the verses was uh, 61. That stood out to me because it was sort of different than what I read yesterday. Hold on, let me see if the bathroom is empty. Cause, you know what I'm saying? I know the way I do these blogs are unorthodox, but it is what it is. I like the bathroom environment, y'all. And the fact that I'm walking around, it makes this shit even more better. Because it's not traditional and a traditional orthodox type of approach. Anyway, so uh, verse 61. Okay, when I got to 61, it stood out because, okay, yesterday, just like what I mentioned in the first two blogs, you know, I got to a portion to where. put this right here. This shit distracted me, all this extra shit. Anyway, I got to a portion yesterday to where they were saying, like, um, when, when, I, when I mentioned how I was kind of confused exactly who they was talking to, even though I know now, but, you know, they was giving advice as far as, like, how to, you know, kind of include yourself in a circle of people that don't believe what you believe, but at the same time, your mission being to try to persuade them how you must play it by ear basically like if they're not trying to hear what you're saying you can't really try to force your opinions on them but you sit down with them and you talk about whatever they talk about and then when the opportunity arises that's when you go ahead and do what you do or whatnot if they don't listen to blah 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 and then they start talking about you know how to how to keep your composure or how to deal with people that may straddle the fence when you're in a circumstance like that when you may face scorn or whatnot or doubt but at the same time you want to convert these people so anyway that's what i mentioned with the first two blogs right just cat up in here so today when i got to 61 uh they were like as far as the dialogue they were like okay when you Come across people 
and basically they're not really believing what you're talking about this time you know you walk up to them you sit down and you say well let's have my sons and your sons and my women and your women etc we all sit down and we speak in earnest in other words it was said that you put up like a challenge in other words where you take your truths and what you believe and you sit down with somebody else a group or whatnot and you had those people compare what they believe to what you believe and that way you could dissect what's actually true now I'm pause right there I thought that was fucking interesting number one again because it's different from the approach that I mentioned yesterday that I read when I read again book four and verse 130 up until 170 within that dialogue itself and that sort of that's the approach that they were saying like if somebody not listening to you don't waste time with them you know what I'm saying like change the sub not, not don't waste time with them but like you know try to change the subject and then kind of like slick your way in the mix or whatnot in order to uh, accomplish your aim but this time they were saying okay just sit down and have a conversation with these people and y'all just do y'all comparisons I thought that was different but another thing that stand out is because it brought a lyric in my head you know, from one of my favorites back in the day. It's a dude named Cannabis. I'm going to keep quoting him because I think his shit is timeless. I'm like, okay, I like that idea because I'm, I'm, you know, not getting off the subject, but I consider myself a person. I consider myself a truther. And I'm not talking about the political shit with the birthers and all that. I'm talking about just trying to figure out and discern, trying to ask, trying to discern what the fuck is the truth, basically. So that's what was mentioned in this dialogue. And as far as Cannabis, he had a lyric that kind of like uh, summarizes that. It was like um, visual image sharpness between artists. I don't think you know what you're about to get involved in. Let me mention that again. This is visual image sharpness between artists. I don't think you know what you was, what you was about to get involved in. Basically, essentially the same shit. Sit down, take what you believe, they take what they believe, and y'all honestly compare that shit and then see what comes out as the medium truth. You know what I'm saying? If your side doesn't completely overshadow what the other side has to offer. I like that part. Then another verse that stood out to me aside from that one was verse 67. 67. Okay, with this verse, this is when they mentioned uh, Abraham. All right. This is the same. This is the same dialogue that's going on, and this is also a part of the instruction. So it was like, okay, basically, it was like, uh, you know, you say you believe in Abraham, and these people that came after him, or whatnot. But how do you know if that's true if you haven't witnessed it yourself? Only God knows, and. Wouldn't it be better to kind of like reason about it? When I read that part, I liked that. And then it was like, uh, it went on and it was like, uh, it went on to 68, the next verse. And it was like, uh, he said, he said, Moses, well, not Moses, Abraham. He said, Abraham was not a Jew or a Christian. This is in the Quran. He was not a Jew or a Christian. And he was not even a polytheist. That was what was said. He was just somebody that searched for truth. All right, this is within this Surah. This is Surah 61 to 62, book three. I was like, oh, okay. That stood out to me as well. Uh, I think it was something else that I wanted to say about it, which was, um, damn. What was it that I wanted to say? Um, yeah, anyway, yeah. So I was like, oh, okay, I can respect that. You know what I'm saying? Again, that ties back into as far as like how my approach is and the type of approach that I normally respect, which is somebody that just dissects truth. So that's basically the whole understanding, the understand, or that's basically all that they said as far as those surahs from 33 up until 70. I want to make sure I'm not skipping nothing else. Uh, yeah. Yeah, basically, that's it. So, damn, what was it? Um, 
the Nubia thing. Let me let me touch on the Nubia thing real quick, just to make sure I don't forget. Those two blogs, I want to make a correction. This is more, it's somewhat of a correction, not really. Those two blogs, I mentioned something that I got on my Facebook that I wrote down in my new section a long time ago. It was regarding the Nubian king because my understanding at the time, based on what I had read, even before I found out about these two Nubian, about these Nubian kings, is that Jesus died between 07 and 09 AD. When I did my double checking, you know, it was another date that was placed out there, which was like, uh, I want to say they said 4 BC, that he could have been born around 4 BC. And I'm like, damn, they kind of mess up the king list a little bit, you know, as far as like uh, one of, and it, matter of fact, this is not really off the subject because it pertains to the whole Islamic view regarding Jesus or whatnot. So I'm like, shit, I'm like, it kind of messed up my, my the, the king's list because I'm thinking that Jesus was born either 26 or 24 BC. And if he died at 33, that's perfect because that would mean he died either in 07 or 09, right? And during that time, the queen of Nubia, or what they call Kush, her name was Amani, Re Amani Renus, Amani Renus, but she was also referred to another title that was given to somebody such as a queen of Kush was Kandake, and it's really pronounced as Candace, but the way it's spelled is K-A-N-D-A-K-E, and she was the queen during that time, but she was the queen for a while, and it was from five, wait a minute, not five, but um, forty BC up until ten BC, and then her husband originally, because I had forgot his name when I met, did the first two practice blogs about this, it was a guy named Terry Tequis, and then he ended up dying again, sometime between twenty-two and or twenty-eight to twenty-two. BC, and that's during the period that this whole big battle between them and the Romans took place when Caesar Augustus ruled because he ruled. And I had to double check this too from 27. No, actually, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they say 28 to 22 BC, but he himself he ruled from 27 uh, BC up until probably. 14 AD or something like that between 9 and 14 AD one of them but he ruled during that time so like the time frame as far as what I thought was the birth of Jesus between 22 and 28 BC or 28 to 22 BC you know when this whole uh, battle between the Romans happened during that time Terry Tequis ended up dying and then that's when his son Akinia died became the next king of uh, Nubia or Cush at that time. So when I reread about the, the birth of Jesus, I'm like, damn, they placed the shit before BC. What the fuck? So I had to look at the king's list again, and it didn't have the name of the king, but it did have the name of the Candace or the queen of Nubia. And it was a lady named uh, Aminisha K2. I'm in this K2, so it's spelled A-M-I-N-I-S-H-A-K-H-E-T-O. And she was the queen or the candidate for about 10 years, so her, her shit was from uh, 10 B.C. after the first queen died, Amani Renus, 10 B.C. up until the first, up until 01 A.D. Okay, so this is a 10 year period. So I'm like, okay, if. Jesus was born in 4 BC, or at least close to it, but they put 4 BC, then she would have had to have been the Candace of the Queen. So whoever her fucking husband is would have been the person that came and visited Jesus. Because that was my understanding. It was some guy named Melchior. 
that went to Jerusalem when Jesus was born, when this guy named Herod. Well, anyway, he, he was the person that went to Jerusalem when Jesus was born. But then I went to double check that tonight as well. I'm like, now let me say this real quick. This is the fucking reason why I cannot stand reading third-hand sources. They can be convenient, but when I come across a situation like this, this is why I get fucking irritated. When I went back to double check it, that's when I found out like, okay, Melchior, that's one interpretation that he could have been a Nubia king. Some other, some people, these are all Wikipedia type of articles, by the way. Other people think that he could have been like somebody from Persia, you know, some type of king from Persia, because it was supposed to have been three of them all together. But then as far as like re like uh, re rereading these fucking Wikipedia articles just to make sure, another mention was about the book of Matthew. And they claim that uh it was never specified exactly where these how many of them were, first off, and exactly where did they come from. You know, they were just Maggies. That's it. So I was like, fuck. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, okay, I got to throw out that whole, not even throw it out, but I got to, like, research. See, see, that that's going to occur when I do my whole little blog about Bill O'Reilly. The whole essence of this one was just to understand exactly where Islamists were coming from. But this additional information does kind of somewhat pertain, but it helps for, like, a future blog. It gets me more familiar with certain shit so I know exactly where I got to go with each uh, exotic detail that I come across. So I'm like, damn, you know what I'm saying? So whoever the king of Nubia was from 10 BC all the way up until 01 AD, if it is true that it's never been really denoted that one of these people came from Nubia, then it don't even fucking matter, you know what I'm saying? But still, I don't really, I feel like when I dig for it deeper as far as myself, when I do a, a vlog specifically about Jesus himself and not necessarily him tying to Islamic religion or whatnot, then I find out for sure. But that battle real quick though, as far as like the Romans and the Nubians, that did take place. And like I say, they mentioned it from 28 to 22 BC. Sometime between that six year period, this battle took place. And there is an historical account. This comes from a guy named Strabos, all right? Who was a Roman, but he was also a historian. He had a book called Geography or something like that. And and that book is where he mentioned uh, Candace, the Candace of Nubia, or uh, Amani Renas. You know, but he referred to her as like having one eye or something, like the one eye Candace, or I like to say the one eye Candake. So I'm like, okay, there's some truth there because somehow, you know, based on this little article that I read about what he put and, you know, they had his quotations there, which is a good book to check out in the future, which I will in the future. But they was, he was saying that Rome wanted to incorporate the Nubians because they had already took over Egypt. And so, you know, they was uh, fighting as far as Philae and basically... Basically, they wanted to conquer the Nubians. But, you know, whatever this big battle, whenever exactly this big battle took place between 28 to 22 BC, the Romans lost. And so they were never able to conquer these people as far as that far back then. So that's definitely true. Like I said, I'll check into that later. Now, going back into the Quran, right? Now, uh, another thing that I wanted to double check as far as like when the Quran was written. Because I know for sure it was put together at least 100 years after Muhammad died. But the only thing that I came across was, because I remember I came across the date a long time ago, but this time I came across like the first official printing of the Quran. That took place in the 6th, 16th century. And that was in Italy. It was in uh, Venice, yeah, Venice, Italy. And it was two guys that did it. Really one, but they give his son some credit also. Okay, the first guy, his name was um, Pagino. No, hold on. Um, Paganino Paganini. And his son, his name was Alessandra. No, Alessandro or Alessandro uh, Paganini. 
and they both is from Italy. Really, uh, Paganino Paganini was from Brescia, and then he moved to Venice in Italy at a younger age. This is all what I read. Now, this is Wikipedia. All this, all this what I'm saying so far, uh, aside from the source, is Wikipedia. So he was brought there as a young man, and he grew up. He was born in 1450, to be exact. So that would be, what, the same, really the same year that Juan de la Cosa was born. 1450. And when he grew up, he became a, 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 Basically, somebody that made, you know, that, that, that printed, a printer, basically, that made copies for other people and shit like that. So that's what he became. And he first started doing that in 14... 83, at the age of 33 years old. So 1483 is when, wait a minute, hold on, i to make sure I get it right. Yeah, 1483 is when he first started doing that. Then later on in life, around 15, 17, that's when he moved back to uh, Brescia. No, fucking it up. No, 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 no. Yeah, he started printing in, in, in 1483. And then when 1517 came, him and his son moved back to Brescia. And then there was a place on this lake called Lake Garter, a little island. It was called um, Isola del Garda. And it was a monastery there that he started a printing business from. Okay, that's how that happened. This is uh, 1517. So sometime between 1537 and 1538, to be exact, August 9th of 1537, to August of 1538. It didn't give a specific date on that part. But between that time is when the first fit official print out of the Quran was made. And him and his son is given credit for that. So I thought that was fucking interesting only because of the, uh, the parallel. So I tried to figure out like, you know, what was the um, religion of Italy at the time and I couldn't really find too much. I just knew that um, as far as uh, the Republic of Italy, like they did a lot of trading and stuff like that. They didn't mention really too much as far as the religion. So I was trying to figure out like, what was the inspiration for this guy printing out the Quran in the first place? You know, for him to make printouts like that, somebody was gonna make money somehow if he was gonna end up trading it. I know one of the articles they did say maybe he was doing it for the Ottoman Empire, but that was too much of a maybe. He wasn't no for sure. Only reason I wanted to know his inspiration is because I'm trying to figure out like, like some of the language in the Quran, you know, some of the things that's in there, just like what I mentioned with the first two blogs don't make sense. As far as like uh, the belief in, a, in God actually being a man, I'm still wondering like what some of the language kind of parsed throughout the years. You see what I'm saying? Especially if the Quran was first officially printed uh, in Europe and I'm scared to really make that claim, but like I say, this is just based off Wikipedia articles. The reason why I'm kind of nervous to make that that, that that claim is because of what I know that went on in Spain way before the 16th century. But, you know, as far as, like, what they, uh, scholars, I guess, attribute, they say the first official printout was in Italy. Again, 1537 to 1538. So I thought that was interesting, and I'm like, okay, I just, again, I'm just wondering, like, did they parse some of the language because... Muhammad coming from the religion of Jahiliyyah, and them having those three main deities, at least four, but three of them. But one that I remember off top because I liked it, it stood out and it made sense, which is Allah, and that meaning uh, like the whole or whatnot. I'm like, how the fuck did he go from that and then have this little debate back and forth with uh, Huye Ibn Aktab, and Huye Ibn Aktab becomes so drained. And at the same time, he got all his kajis of people like that, who, uh, like Musa Ibn Umar, for example, people like that, or uh, 
Mu'af Ibn Jabal, you know, all these different Kazis that went around and preached this to people and they had to debate and all this type of shit. I don't see how he, it's hard for me to, 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 to comprehend that Muhammad will look at God and believe that God is also literally just a person at the same time, but at the same time, omnipresent. It's hard for me to wrap that around my head. So I, I kind of, I'm somewhat skeptical, a little bit skeptical as far as like the absoluteness of the Quran as it's presented today. You get what I'm saying? The official prints out of the Quran in the 16th century, that's what? Okay, Muhammad died in 632. So, you talking 900 years? Yeah, about 900 years later. Of course, a lot of shit may be parched. And then going back to this book, The Origins of an Islamic State, the dialogues within that book that I came across don't really hint. Like, okay, here's an example to make my point. Okay, thinking about the Negus. And I don't really want to go that far back, but maybe I might. Thinking about the Negus, right? Ashama Ibn Abjar. All right? He became the Negus of the Oxamites in what? 614 AD, right? This is around the same fucking time that this whole revolution in Arabia was going, in Mecca was going on, and people was leaving, right? So he became that in 614, and sometime between 632 and 634 AD is when he died. Now, uh, Jafar ibn Abu Talib, Muhammad's cousin, who was also raised within the same household with him under Abu Talib. Now, he was one of those people, I'm talking about Jafar, he was one of those people along with Azubair and a whole host of other people, including Muhammad's uh, third to last wife. All of these people ended up going to Ethiopia. All right? Now, the thing that I remember when I first started reading that book, The Origins of an Islamic State, and I started doing my cross-referencing and all that type of shit, when I read about this, when they went to the Negus or the Oxumites, that wasn't the end of the story. People from Quraysh sent delegates over to have these people brought back into Mecca as fugitives. So when they went to the Oxumites, and they met up with the Negus, I'm talking about the delegates. That's when the dialogue ensued, Now this dialogue is recorded. And I remember part of the dialogue, you know, they was trying to get in the Negus' head, they was trying to get in Oshama's head, it was like, well, you know, these guys, they basically preach that Jesus was a created being. In other words, they was trying to tell the Negus that their belief in Jesus was that he was born through an immaculate conception which would hint at the fact that it's other than what the Negus believe at the time. Unfucking deniable when you read the dialogue. So I'm like, the whole con the concept of Jesus and his d divinity and him being uh, get, not given, but him possession, possessing these special powers would be somewhat unrealistic and because their view of Jesus is that he was born or his, the circumstances of his birth didn't have anything to do with the Immaculate Conception. But at the same time, they believe that God was actually a fucking person and refers to him as a he. And then, like I mentioned in those two blogs, you know, uh, one of the prophets that... Uh, God sent messages to, I forget exactly which one, but one of the prophets that God sent messages to, and one of these prophets had the opportunity to speak directly with God himself instead of just Gabriel or an angel or some type of fucking mediator. You see what I'm saying? This is also a part or written in the Quran. Again, the surah between 130 and 170 that I mentioned yesterday that I talked about. Somewhere within that whole little surah, one of those verses, this was mentioned there. So I'm like, I wonder, was that part kind of like an add-on? Is there some type of embellishment? It's something about it 
that comes off as suspect to me. But anyway, the whole thing is as far as like uh, that, I'm like, okay, I know for sure, you know, the niggas, you know, they were Christians, but obviously either they were of uh, the Aryan interpretation or the Nestorian interpretation. And just to make, you know, just to make it clear, like I say, when they first got converted in 333, when Izana was the Nagus then, you know, they believed in what most people who are Christians today believe in, which is the Trinitarian doctrine. And I explain why, because uh, St. Fermentius, when he went to Egypt, again, this is all within the same year, when he went to Egypt and he met up with um, Athanasius, and then he was blessed to become a bishop and be the first bishop of Ethiopia at the time. Uh, Saint Athena Athanasius was also somebody that believed in like the Trinitarian doctrine at the time. So it wouldn't make sense that he'll go ahead. Damn, I can't believe my phone is finna die. It wouldn't make sense that he'll go ahead and bless somebody to be a fucking Aryan Christian. You see what I'm saying? So uh, Saint Frumentius would have had to believe the same shit that he believed in. So when he went back to the to the to the Aksumites and he converted Izana, who was the king from 320 to 360 AD, and then that's when they went into Arabia and started building churches there. They had one built in a place called Zafar. And they also converted people as far as with their Najran. Because under the rule of King Izana, at the time, you know, he had portions of of, of uh southern Egypt, of course Sudan uh, Ethiopia, obviously, which would include Somalia back then, but it's also mentioned Southern Arabia. And Najran is in Southwestern Arabia, directly above Yemen, all right? So therefore, if he brought Christianity there, that's the first interpretation that they brought. But then you had these subsequent episodes to where other people, uh, such as... Um, um, uh, Theophilus the Indian who made a journey there in 355 when he was sent by Constantine II. Theophilus the Indian was also a Christian but he was of uh, the uh, Aryan influence, Aryan interpretation of Jesus. And then even like what, 11 years before him Constantine II also made a visit into Arabia. And then he went to a place called Zafar, and it was mentioned that three Ethiopian churches was built, and he visited one there. All right, so that's a sign that they did spread Christianity there. But being that Constantine II was of the Aryan influence, you could say he kind of, you know, provided a little niche as far as that influence. And I personally believe when he sent Theophilus the Indian after him, 11 years later, that was just a, a kind of like a because it was a religious mission. He sent them there on a religious mission. And being that these two characters, Theophilus the Indian and Constantine II are of the same interpretation, then his mission was to go there and spread that interpretation. So I believe that's when that was, you know, brought and not, not infused, but uh, further, I don't want to say further built upon, but he was basically sent there to persuade people to that school of thought. I honestly fucking believe that. And then, uh, let me see. Then you got, I say Haya, but they call him Haye. You got him that came between, what, 437 and 459, or 438 and 459. Yeah, during that time, because, yeah, sometime during that time, because Yazdegur II was the fucking ruler of the Persians at the time. But as far as, like, in al Hira, this guy Haya or Haye, you know, he made it into al Hira during that time. Again, 438 to 459 A.D. And he left al which was... Many different people living there, but the... A Christian population lived there too. And these were Nestorian Christians, right? So when he left Al Hira, that's when he went into Najran, because he's one of those people that's potentially credited with also bringing Christianity there. But from my scope and the way I look at it, he's definitely one of those people that brought there, 
but he didn't bring Christianity. He brought a certain interpretation, which is Nestorianism. And I believe he influenced people uh, in Najran, for example, because when you fast forward, and I'm thinking about the, 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 the blog I did a long time ago about Najran, the 